listening to The Writing Life, interviewing real writers about making a living from their words. Hi, we are The Writing Life, and I'm here with Kitty. Hi. And today we have Sarah Jasmon. Hello. Hi. Thank you very much for coming. And Sarah is going to start reading an extract from her first novel. So please, whenever you want. Alice, 1973, Greece. So much blue. From where she sat, at the very back of the ferry, this was all Alice could see. The island had changed from a place to a shape to the faintest blur and now it was gone, without leaving a trace. Jacob was out there. She should have stayed. She wanted to take off, to dive into the sea and make her way back. Instead, her body pressed itself into the heated metal of the deck. How would he find her now she was gone? The gulls circled, screaming for her. She closed her eyes. This was the same sun, she thought, giving the same heat, the heat that all summer had kept her pinned to the sand, and alongside the unnumbered days, the heat that spilled into the nights. She squeezed her eyes shut more tightly. If she concentrated hard enough, surely she could piece it back together. There had been music, and they were dancing. Jacob was telling her something she didn't want to hear. She could picture his mouth, but the sounds it made were a jabber. She couldn't slow them down to make sense of the words. She remembered the light, though, flooding out from the villa as she staggered away, and his brother holding her by the shoulders. Pete was always there when she needed him, of course, but when had this happened? The memories were slides, changing too fast. She couldn't be sure of the order anymore. Think. Think. Jacob, lying on the ground. Her mind flashed into hiding like a gecko touched by lamplight. She forced it back, waiting for him to get back up, conjuring up the sound of the cicadas, the scent of the jasmine. No, her memory was playing tricks. Pete had explained it all about Jacob leaving and why she must take the children back to England. They would sail to Athens and the aeroplane would take them away. Everything would be fine. She inhaled as the nausea returned, and again her hand circled on her stomach. It was the motion of the ferry, that was all. Voices approached. She wanted them to stay away. They were her children, and she loved them. Of course she did. But they needed too much of her, and she had nothing to give. Even before she started taking the pills, it was as if someone had sliced her in half and scooped her out. Seth studied her with his eight-year-old eyes and seemed to understand that Victoria's demands were insistent and shrill. She'd always been her daddy's girl. Alice allowed them to lean into her with their golden summer skin. What would they remember? Fantastic. Thank you very much for reading that to us. (laughs) That was really intense. So, in your blog, the first two sentences in your bio are I'm a writer, I live on a boat. So... I was wondering if those two things are interconnected in some way. I think they really are. Not in a direct way, Mm. um, but I started writing properly within a year or so of moving onto the boat. Mm. And I think I always feel that living on a boat is kind of like living on the fringes of of society, if you like. I mean, not really. I don't feel excluded (laughs) or anything. But it, it almost gives me permission to do things that I want to do um, rather than the things maybe I'm expected to do, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's interesting because I was also thinking about this Japanese writer, Haruki Murakami, who wrote a book comparing like the process of running marathons with other writing. And yeah, I think that was really inspiring to me. And I was wondering if the process of sailing or of living in such a place like a boat, as you are saying, like 
I think maybe living. I don't sail the boat very much. Okay. I don't. <laughs> I don't really go anywhere. Um, we've been moored at the same place for ten years now. Ooh, um, okay. And I mean, just little. You know, we do little trips to get water and that sort of thing. But mm. I don't. It, it takes a long time to sail anywhere. Okay. But living on the bank and not having walls and garden fences and that sort of thing, mm. um, it makes it all very open. And I think that definitely feeds in. In your blog, you also mentioned that you wanted to be a writer since you were nine, but it took you a while to actually consider yourself an author. Was there some kind of trigger for that or moment when you allowed yourself to see yourself that way? Um, I think I always felt like I was a writer inside. That was, if I thought about what I wanted to do, even as I got older and didn't really do anything about it, it was something that was very consistent that I always wanted to do. But it wasn't until um, I got divorced and during that process decided to take um, an MA in creative writing Mm. because it was something that I'd always wanted to do and now was the time that I had the space really to do it. And so that helped because I met other people who were writers and that made me feel it was okay to be a writer and want to spend time doing that rather than only doing it in spare time mm. or, or when nothing else needed doing. Um, and then, I guess, having a publishing deal, then you can finally <laughs> <laughs> say you're a writer. If you're feeling forms or telling people what you do, you can say, yes, I'm a writer, because the next question you can say, oh, I'm a writer, and they say, oh, what have you written? Oh, well, uh, nothing yet, you know. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> but having the book... It's something you can actually say. It's a physical thing that you can say to people, you know, this is something that I do. Mm. And speaking of meeting other writers, um, you belong to a group of writers called the Prime Writers, all published after the age of 40. I think that's something that will be very inspiring. Can you tell us a bit more about how that came about? Mm. Um, One of the writers, um, Antonia Honeywell, uh, her first book, The Ship, came out last year as well. She tweeted about just asking um, if there were other people who were published Mm. for the first time after they were 40 and and was deluged. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And we talked backwards and forwards for a bit and then decided to meet up, had a lunch in London um, where I think there were about 40 people went, maybe not quite 30 or 40. Anyway, um, now there are 60 of us in the group. Wow. Um, more people always, you know, asking about joining. And it's been great. It's been really good because you can feel a little bit like you can't... You know, the debut writers are expected to be young. You're expected to do this sort of thing in mm. your 20s, maybe. Um, and it's just never too late. You know, life gets in the way sometimes of, of what you're doing. Or you might just be writing and writing and not getting anywhere mm. um, but it really isn't too late you can do it any time it's great mm. <laughs> and it's really nice to know other people in the same position <laughs> yeah that's fantastic so do you think that writing is a lonely activity or I can see why it might be <laughs> um, I don't particularly find it that way partly because on the boat there's not very much... Well, I mean, it's quite a lot of space in a way because it's a wide beam boat, so it's 12 feet wide, 58 feet long, so it's quite a lot of space. But there aren't separate rooms. You can't go and shut the door and be away from everybody else. So when I'm writing, if I've got two of my children still live at home, they're Mm. around doing things. (laughs) Um, My boyfriend is a writer. He doesn't live on the boat, but I spend quite a lot of time in Manchester with him. And there's Facebook and Twitter. <laughs> yeah. I don't think writers can ever be lonely again because we all spend far too much time on Facebook and Twitter. And speaking of social media, do you, do you find it useful for your writing career or is it, is it more of a distraction than a, a help to you? I think it's really hard to quantify how much help it is. In a sense, I mean, I, I feel that I have a, a real network of writers and people in the publishing industry and readers and bloggers we all interact on twitter there's a lot of talk but it's quite an enclosed world as well so although it's very busy it doesn't have much effect in the wider world Mm -hmm. um 
So whether, I mean, there's a publicist, one of the big publicists came to talk to the prime, in a prime writers session and said, oh, Twitter doesn't sell books. So it, it's not in that way useful, maybe. But it gives you a lot of confidence knowing that you're not the only one there. Mm-hmm. And it's a great way of meeting people. I just love the fact that you can send a comment to anybody who's on Twitter. And I mean, some of them might not answer, but some of them do. And you get to know people and yeah. make some really good friends. Mm-hmm. And you're not bound by geography or work or just happening to be in the same place. You know, you can just do it online. Yeah, that's a really useful insight to have on it, actually, because a lot of people just say, oh, social media, you can't have enough of it. You have to have it for your profile, but you have to be realistic about it and what it can achieve at the same time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was checking on your blog. I love blogging as well. And I found it, it was really pretty, like, you know, all the layout and everything. It looked very professional, of course, and very appealing. And So would you advise, like, to aspiring writers to open a blog? Oh, definitely. Mm. Um, when I so I did my MA, um, and that was great. I did that over in Manchester and um, started to get to know other writers and started to write regularly for a deadline. But I still wasn't going anywhere particularly definite. I didn't have any anything in in sight mm. to um, in terms of publication, and I decided that I would put my book to one side because I had to finish my novel for my um, MA um, but when I'd finished that I put it to one side because it needed editing it needed work do some work that needed that, that would get me some money <laughs> so we'll need to make an income at the end of the day but alongside of that I also volunteered for Lancaster Lit Fest um, they were looking for volunteers for the festival and also for social media coverage um, So I came up for a meeting and it was very open, you know, what do you think would work? Come up, you know, come up with your own ideas. And I thought it would be interesting to interview some of the writers who were taking part in the festival. And I did that. And they were just quick, you know, there were five questions. And I really enjoyed doing it. It was a lot of fun. And then when I did blog posts for the various events that I went to, I put them on the website as well. Um, And after the festival finished... I thought, wow, I can carry on with this. This would be a good way. So I carried on doing that, talking to other writers, writing reviews. And it was as a direct result of that that the editor who who eventually bought my book, she asked me about it because I'd mentioned it on my website. And so she found it because I had a website. I wouldn't have had the website, maybe, if I hadn't done the volunteering for Lit Fest. It all goes round in a circle but it's really good for visibility and it's good for people to be able to see what you can do because you can really showcase yourself, not just the novels or short stories, but just in general, writing. Um, and one other thing, I think it's a really good way of paying it forwards. I feel like, you know, I've reviewed people and talked to people. Other people now do that for me as well. Mm-hmm. And it's a really important network. Yeah. You don't write in isolation you don't sell books in isolation it's, it's all a community and I feel that it's good to be on both sides of that Brilliant. so if there was one person who you haven't interviewed yet who you would just love to interview who would it be and what would you ask them oh there's so many <laughs> <laughs> um, I would like to interview one of my favourite books I read over and over again um, is The Shipping News by Annie Prue and I think it's an amazing book it's a really beautiful book and I can never I never get tired of it however many times I read it I'd love to talk to Annie Prue and ask her why she decided to set this one book at such a distance from the other work she does because everything else I've read of so The Shipping News is set in Newfoundland which is a cold and wet and windy place at the top of the world <laughs> um, all of her others are in in Arizona in deserty areas mm. um, and I just think that's really interesting <laughs> having the, is, is that special because it's set in a different place what triggered it what made her want to write it and how about competitions do you think like entering competitions is a good idea for aspiring writers I think they're really useful uh, I think one thing with writing is it's great to have a deadline 
and have a reason to write something. And deciding to write something for a competition is a good way mm, of yeah. giving yourself a deadline. But the prices do stack up <laughs> when you're paying five, ten, I think. You know, there's some that are 17, 18 pounds to enter. Mm -hmm. it, it gets to be a lot of money very quickly. So I think it's good to pick and choose a bit. Would you pay to enter a competition? Because I know there is a bit of a debate yeah. about paying or not paying. I do, I do sometimes. Um, mm -hmm. If I have a story that I think is, um, is, is suited to a competition, then I will sometimes. But it is a lot of competition. <laughs> as well as a lot of competitions there's a lot of competition within that and it can very easily get dispiriting to be mm -hmm. paying for something that you're not achieving anything and you don't see the achievement you don't see how far you've come up the list you don't know ever know how close you were or and you don't also know why it didn't work mm -hmm. um i've heard i've talked to people who've judged competitions who say how much it can just be a tiny bit separating you know there's stories that they really loved but the other judges didn't it's, it's very hard yeah, to yeah. and it does it they all say you know it, it doesn't mean that your story wasn't good but you don't know do you <laughs> um, I think it's nice to mix it with journals because you could submit to journals without paying anything um, mm. I know writers who've got amazingly organized spreadsheets and they have stories out all the time you know they have a, a bunch of stories and they know exactly where they are and when they come back in they send them out to something else I'm really not like that <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness do you have any kind of writing routine though is there a strategy you try to stick with or is it just as and when it comes for yeah I mean, I, I'm pretty sure that the reason I didn't write very much of any length until I started doing the MA was because I didn't have an end to aim towards, other mm. than a very nebulous, one day I'm going mm. to write a novel sort of end. So having deadlines is really, really helpful to me, because mm. I will keep on putting it off, and just thinking about things or planning it, rather than actually, I think everyone I know as a writer knows that it's really hard to sit down and make yourself get started. That's the, the hardest bit, once you're, in the mm. go once you're going it's somehow not as difficult so I do write when I have to <laughs> yeah. yeah I do try I mean in my head I have a right okay if I write 500 words every day then my novel will be finished in four months or whatever um, but then suddenly two months have gone by and I haven't really got around to anything <laughs> so, yeah, yeah I know that feeling <laughs> and of course with the masters it's not only the deadlines but the feedback as well was that the first time you'd had formal feedback on your work yes yes it was oh goodness was it scary or was it helpful in the main I mean definitely helpful but I remember I still remember the first <laughs> well I I didn't have anything in for workshopping until the second session but I remember the first session I'd had the other people's submissions in and I'd read them and made notes and had loads to say about it and you know of course that was absolutely fine <laughs> and then suddenly it was me on the other end and I was really surprised at just how scary that was mm -hmm. yeah really we really know. yeah raised heart rate hard to breathe scary and it's difficult isn't it I think yeah, <laughs> yeah we've um, been when, it. <laughs> <laughs> and you always hear the negative feedback louder than the positive yeah, feedback you do, you do, yeah. but it's so good it's so good to hear because I think you can I'm, I'm always so much better at spotting things that are working or not working in other people's work mm -hmm. and therefore it's the same backwards people can see yeah. it more clearly when it's when it's down to mine so yeah yeah feedback <laughs> is essential <laughs> you have anyone who received still free feedback from right now or Yeah, um, I'm in a, a writing group. We meet roughly once a month. Mm. Um, so we put, um, not, you know, we don't all put stuff in every month, but that goes in and we meet up and have a chat about it. And like I said, my boyfriend, he's a writer, so we do quite a lot of swapping mm. between mm. ourselves. Um, that's, that's kind of it at the moment. But I also work quite closely with my agent and my editor. Um, so that was through the editing process of my first book. But it's also been a real process of mm. discussing the next book with them mm. to plan the outline of it. Um, and that's been really useful. And they really have no problem in telling me when things aren't working. 
<laughs> but they're also really good at saying when things are working and giving me ideas, you know, have you thought of this? How about trying that? So could you tell us a bit about the, the process you went through of finding an agent and, and getting your first book published? I think it wasn't typical in lots of ways, but then the more I talk to other people, the less I think there is a typical way of mm. getting there. I had only sent the novel to one agent at this stage, um, and she hadn't, well, she hadn't been interested. Um, so I, again, thought, well, I, it needs editing. I won't send it until I've had time to edit it, and then I wasn't getting around to editing. <laughs> um, I went to an awards event in London, um, which was sponsored by Transworld, and so I found myself in a room with lots of people in publishing, which was a great opportunity to talk to people, not specifically to try and sell my book to them, but just to talk about what they expected or what would make a good pitch for them. Um, there was one particular editor called Jo Unwin, who is now an agent. She was an agent before, worked in, as an editor for a while. She's now an agent again. And so I asked her if I could try my pitch on her. It was an elevator pitch, so just a, you know three sentences to sell it. Um, and she was great. She listened to it, liked it, and it ended up saying, well, you know, send it along to me and I'll read through it. But I wasn't expecting anything from her because mm. she was an editor, so that was missing out the agent stage. I met another editor that night as well, um, Katie Loftus, who, because I was writing reviews as well... I'd just started getting proof copies sent to me directly from the publishers. So I was talking to her about it and asking if she'd maybe send me some proof copies. And this was the point where she went away and had a look at my website and sent me an email saying, oh, I see you've written a book, but I can't find it anywhere. And I was like, because it's well. not my computer. <laughs> <laughs> um, so again, I just said to her, I'll send it if you like. You know, it'd be great to have another professional point of view. Again, not expecting anything. Um, and within a couple of weeks, they both got back to me. Jo, um, with some very encouraging feedback um, and the offer to introduce me to an agent. And Katie, um, which was really exciting, saying that she really loved it and would like to um, work towards commissioning, which is quite a long process. There was lots of backwards and forwards and discussion, and which I had nothing to do with once the offer had been made. I just stood back and my agent took over. But by the end of the summer, um, I had a deal. So that's mm, great. Fantastic. <laughs> that's wow. inspiring. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. you never know who you're talking to who might yeah. help. So it's really great to have something ready yeah. and, and to know what to say. Yeah, to, to seize know. those opportunities when they're offered. Yeah. Definitely. Nowadays, anyways, marketing always seems a very important part. So now that you have your book out, do you still try to promote it through your blog? Or? Definitely. Um, I think it's... I think for, you know, I mean, there are obviously some books that get a lot of publicity backing from the publishers, um, but publishers, they, there's so many books coming out all the time, they can't do a lot for, for all of them. And most authors in my particular stage of our career, we do a lot of the marketing ourselves. I think you have to be prepared to go out there. And again, it's about seizing opportunities and just talking to people. If people ask you to do something, always say yes. <laughs> um, I've had some great contacts. I've approached libraries, bookshops, bloggers, and what have you. Um, and also had other people contacting me as well, asking if I'd write something for them or be interviewed and um, always have a go at it. And it's really hard to tell how much difference that's made mm -hmm. with your first book because I don't have anything to compare it to. But it, it feels good to have some, some control and some opportunity to mm. make the most of it yourself. Mm. Yeah, so don't be afraid of marketing. <laughs> <laughs> also, you have three kids. Do you, in a way, take inspiration from them or you tell stories to them? What is your writing somehow? Um, I've always read aloud to them. So that was years and years and years of reading aloud, um, <laughs> which has been great. And I think that helps in storytelling. So yeah. You get to know the cadences of it when you're reading it out, more so maybe than when you're reading to yourself. When they were little, 
I'd always have to tell them stories to get them moving. You know, it's, I mean, small children take a long time to get anywhere, <laughs> and they want to stop at everything, and they're tired. And I always found the best way to keep them moving was to tell them stories, which we just made up as we went along. So, I don't know, I mean, I'm sure that feeds into it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and it's great. I mean, particularly if I'm writing about young people, yeah. which um, the Summer of Secrets, a lot of it takes place in the summer of 1983 when the main character is 16. So if she and her friend were doing something, I could always stop and think, right, OK, what would Hattie do in that situation? <laughs> what would Fuchsia have done in that situation? And be able to picture them. Mm-hmm. And though it's not about them and the characters aren't anything like them, there's still a certain amount that you can pick up on with that. Mm. Mm. And of course, um, writers increasingly have to do public readings to promote their work. Do you think doing all that reading aloud and storytelling has, has helped you when it comes to situations like that? I think so. I know with love. I love reading out loud. I really <laughs> enjoy doing all the voices. and um, So it is a bit different when you're standing up in front of a lot of people. It does things to your voice. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, I think it is a handy way of practising. And now that you are a published writer, and just imagine, like, for example, one of your kids, one of them wants to be a writer or something, and what would you give any advice? Would you say, no, don't ever try, or please don't try? A couple of years ago, my middle daughter um, decided... Well, she'd written a short story for a competition, okay. actually, um, and it had come in second place. And then she decided not to write the short story as a novel, but to take one of the characters from the novel... Um, and put her into uh, from the short story I mean and put her into another story which she just sat there and wrote away and wrote away and every so often would come and say I'm not quite sure what to do about this bit here and ended up with a 30,000 word book um, when she was 15 I mean now she looks at it and goes oh just terrible that's awful we all have been there <laughs> <laughs> but I think you know that's there were there yeah. and it was good it was really yeah. you know she had a real uh, eye for dialogue sorry it should be an ear for dialogue shouldn't it yeah. ear for dialogue some really good characterisation um, and I think to write that many words at that you know that you can do it you know that all mm-hmm. you have to do is sit down and keep writing mm-hmm. I have some other younger friends one of them has just finished her first novel and she's 21 and I think you know that's brilliant to mm-hmm. have got the first one done at that age mm-hmm. because one of the biggest things that got in my way was being scared of not being able to write that many words. So mm. I didn't write that many words. <laughs> okay. And if you just sit down and keep going, yeah. then it happens. And if you've done it once, great. So what's your, what's your next project? What are you going to sit down and keep writing <laughs> next? <laughs> um, I, it's a two-bit deal, so I am working on the second novel mm-hmm. now. It's set along the canal again, but this time actually on a boat. So a lot of it's going to take place on a mm. boat. So it'll give me a chance of writing from the inside <laughs> out, which is really exciting. Yeah, yeah. brilliant. Okay. Well, it's been fantastically interesting to, to speak to you. And thank you so much for coming to, to talk to the writing Thank work. you so much. Uh, thank thank you. you. It's been great being here. <laughs> Now we want to thank to Teresa, our editor, and Yvonne, the creator of the show.